Wick Chapter 4 dropped in theaters last night, and there's some big twists and turns in this film. So today we're gonna talk the spoilers. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your spoiler-filled thoughts on John Wick Chapter 4. This is a spoiler review. Spoilers is in the title of the video, so no re reason to put a spoiler warning on any of your comments down below. If you haven't watched the movie yet, don't watch this video. Go watch the film. Be surprised as you watch it. Experience it properly. And let's get started talking about spoilers. This movie kicks off somewhat, essentially picking up right where the last movie left off with John Wick training with Morpheus in the sewers. And then he kind of goes out for revenge. And I, I feel like I said this in my spoiler free review. Highly encourage you watch that one before you watch this one, because uh, I'm not going to like dive into a bunch of my favorite things about the movie and the choreography. Cause I already talked about that over there and I don't need to go into spoilers on some of that stuff. But one of the things I mentioned in my spoiler free review is that I felt like this movie nullified the purpose of part three, where this movie might as well be the follow up to part two. There's you know, a couple references here and there of plot beats and things like that. But I feel like they wrote themselves into a corner and they realized, ah, uh, we don't have anywhere to go with some of this stuff. So let's just go where we want to go. So at the beginning of this movie, John Wick immediately goes and kills the elder. So the previous movie sets up this whole thing about there's a guy in the desert who lives in a tent who's over the table. And <laughs> this movie starts off, boom, let's shoot him in the head. And this, of course, makes the table angry, but doesn't really explain anything about who, what, how does this guy factor anything? Why does he live in a desert? We just like, we'll just kill him, remove that aspect. Let's move on. And then right out of the gate, the thing that the, the, the last movie ended with, Winston gets the Continental back by turning on John Wick. And this movie immediately has the table and the marquee reverse that decision, shows up, blows up the Continental, and then they kill the concierge, which undoes at like the whole point of the end of the last movie of like, oh, Winston, that traitor. What? Well, how's John, John going to track down Winston? Do we really want to see John kill Winston? Not really. So what do you have to do? You have to find a way to make the characters and the audience angry right out of the gate at the new villain. So much so that we can forget about the fact that Winston shot John Wick and pushed him off a building. So what do you do? You kill off the concierge. Everybody likes the concierge. He's great. He's fun. Um, so you kill him off instantly. So now Winston wants to join sides with John Wick to get his revenge against these people. And John Wick, who of course was friends with the concierge, would also be able to like put some things aside and understand like, how do we bring Winston and John Wick together? We'll kill off the, the the character that they were both friends with. Now, in the context of this movie, it, it works great and it, it pulls things together. The context of the franchise as a whole, all of this stuff in the first 20 minutes makes it very clear that they weren't quite sure where they were going with the third film, that they were spinning their wheels, just kind of going in circles with what was kind of like, all right, all right, we know we're going to keep on going. We don't want this one to be the end. So let's end with a cliffhanger and Winston does this and does this. And they go against the table. But this is this is why. And then that's all undone. And if you stop and think about it, the third movie just doesn't change much in the scheme of the franchise. Eat with minor rewrites. You could pluck the third film out of the franchise and just do one, two and three where everything that the, the high table is doing in no, number four is because John Wick killed two members of the table and then Winston let him go. And we can't have this chaos, so we're going to make you anyone pay that is tied. Like All of that works without number three. All of it works. Doesn't make the third one, as an action movie, it's still awesome with what they're doing. And I, I go to these movies to watch the awesome action, but clearly they, they weren't quite sure what they were doing with some of that stuff. So next thing kind of talk about there, then we kind of go to the uh, Osaka Continental. 
And one of the things that these you know, franchises always, this franchise has always done is make it clear that everyone has long relationships with other people. John Wick has friends all over the world and the respect of everyone except the handful of fools that think that they can defeat him. These young up and comers that think I can get this guy because they haven't been around long enough to know who he is. Everyone that's been around a long time knows and respects John Wick. And so you have this friend of his in Japan running that continental, his, his daughter who doesn't know John Wick. All she knows is his reputation, the trouble that he's causing and that, that it's going to cause her trouble. Uh, she's nervous, but the friend of John Wick is like, I'm going to be loyal to my friend. And and then other elements side by side with this was then they introduced the blind man character who does not want to kill John Wick, does not want to work for the marquee or the high table. He wants out, but they have leverage over him that they're going to kill someone. Either he kills who they tell him to kill or they're going to kill the person that he cares about, which we learn is his daughter. So right there, they give us a henchman that is a worthy a threat for John Wick. He's an interesting character. Because he's blind and he has a different way that he moves as an interesting personality, but also he's conflicted. And he, you know, he, he lets us, even in a certain way, lets us know more about John Wick because he is torn between all of this, what he wants to do. But so this leads us to our big gigantic set piece in Japan where the agents of the marquee and the table show up knowing that John Wick is going to be there talking to his friend and his friend decides to side with his friend and battle breaks out. And I said this in my spoiler free, but like this movie starts off with an action set piece on the same scale and size as the third act of the previous movie starts off where that movie ended and just massive in size, long, incredible, like these shots where you're just watching it. And John Wick is fighting this one guy and like spinning in their legs. And while they're spinning on the ground, there's another guy running up. So John has to grab his gun and shoot the guy to, to knock him back while he's in the middle of fighting this guy in the ground. And I was just watching it like, that's the little stuff that just makes this feel so different from everything else, where it's all intricate. There's layers to fight choreography. It's not just block, punch, kick, this one guy in front of me. It's Doing something that in and of itself would be the coolest move in any Marvel movie. If someone did this spinning thingy, but there's also a person running up. So it adds a second layer of him shooting a person over there or throwing something at a person over there while intricately fighting the person in front of him. This is awesome. And then it does that a couple times. And instead of doing that a third time, then he smashes through some glass and finds nunchucks. And so it just like keeps changing it up. And so then what it like, it finds three awesome things to see John Wick do with nunchucks. And he even pauses that like he does like a simple, like one of these deals, catches it under the arm. And my audience went, Woo! it started clapping as soon as that happened. Because people cared about like, like it's just fun. Like you show up to see the awesome stuff and they're delivering the awesome stuff that you want in the film. And so you kind of go throughout it. And the, the big kind of thing that happens is that eventually blind man has to kill John Wick's friend there. And all throughout this, you like the the friend as well as the blind man. Like you got Donnie in as the blind man. But also, I mean, like the, the concierge there, uh, they actually wanted this actor potentially to play. I believe his name is Zero the, or whatever, the, the, whatever Mark DeCosco's played in, in part three. They wanted him in that role in that film, but he was busy because he was in Endgame, so he couldn't do it. So then they get him for this one. And so they're getting like world-class talent to fill out each of these different roles and henchmen and fighters. So it's all awesome. And also like interesting of like the samurai style versus the kung fu style all in this. Of You get to all these different styles combating each other, all with the John Wick spice and sauce poured on top of it. So anyway, he, he gets... Um, he dies and you're seeing like the you know, consequences of everything kind of going on. But also the friend didn't mind that he died. And also kind of like it's it shows like it's trying to show different perspectives of people in this world where the whole time the blind man's please don't do this. Please don't do this. Don't make us do this. We don't need bloodshed. We don't need bloodshed. We don't need bloodshed. And but the other friend is like, 
I, I can't let the, the tyranny of these guys go. Like they're, this is not the right way to do any of this. And are you just going to let them keep doing this? Blind man, if he doesn't do this, his daughter dies. That's his ultimate value. Therefore, he, he allows all this to kind of take place. Or he, he, he's doing what he has to do to save his daughter. But other, like this, this friend character, that's not his perspective. Well, like I need to do what's right because otherwise, why am I even, what's even the point of this if I'm I'm not going to do the right thing? So just like even setting up these different perspectives that these different arcs in the film. So I can kind of do some glow hopping in all of this. Uh, and eventually, essentially, they tie John Wick back to his family. Their ticket was torn in the previous film. So he needs to reconnect with them to be able to get back in their good graces in order to be able to... Um, have them set him up to have this duel with the Marquis. So clear objective. I need to get these people to like me again so that I can have this duel where we know John Wick's the best. He can win the duel uh, if he, he can get into that and get all of this forgiven. So give us clear objectives and goals of what's going on. So he shows up and they tell him he has to, it goes to implies all these other things that have happened to where they killed members of this family that John Wick is a part of because of what John Wick did, killing the elder in part three. And so they don't actually want to help him, but they kind of want to help him. They're torn. So they send him to kill the guy, this other guy over here. And it's kind of fun because it's Scott Adkins, this guy that is like the king of direct-to-video martial arts films for the last 15 years. Him and Michael Jai White are like the two kings of direct-to-video action films that none of them are great films, but they all have awesome fights in them and they can do cool flippy kick things. If you're into that kind of thing, which I am, they're like the kings of that genre. And sometimes John Ad uh, Scott Adkins, who has incredible skills and athleticism, gets to have these side roles in these major films. So him being in a John Wick film, like, Awesome. Love to see it. But they give him an interesting, memorable character. He's not just henchman guy that gets to do cool flippy kick things. They make him this wild, over the top guy. They put him in like the fat suit. They give him the grill. And so he gets to play the very lively character that's, you know, cheating in cards with all the characters setting at this deal. And then you get to see him fight in the fat suit with John Wick in the middle of a rave, which as I was watching this scene, John Wick's like running around shooting people in the head. And if you look at the background, people in the background are like, look over. And see, someone gets shot or thrown or punched, and then they get back to raving. <laughs> it's the goof, the strange details required to have the atmosphere that they want for these movies. There's people at a rave still raving while people's heads are being shot in right <laughs> next to them. But anyway, that's just the world of John Wick. Hey, we're, we've all seen people shot in the head while we're at a rave. It happens all the time. But you get to see John, or John, keep saying John Adkins, combining John Wick and Scott Adkins. Scott Adkins fighting John Wick. Now, I wish we could have got a little bit more. Um, they want to have the cool atmosphere and a different look to it. So there's like rain pouring down. So if you hire someone with the athleticism of Scott Adkins, I would think you'd want him to be able to show that off a little bit more than just doing a few high kicks while in a fat suit. So... I would have liked to get a little bit more out of the sequence, but in general, I love that Scott Atkins actually got a fun, memorable, interesting character. Anyway, they kill him. He steals the tooth and takes it to them. So they, they reinstate him. And so then we're able to make this challenge to have this fight. And because Pennywise is aware of the fact he's probably going to lose this, he starts raising the bounty and starts announcing where John Wick is at, where he's headed. So puts as many assassins between him and this final duel, setting up this just insane final 40 minutes of this movie and more of this weird world building where there's an assassin radio station in the world of John Wick. There's literally like an announcer lady like, John Wick is turning and down left on this street. Let's put on one of our favorite fight songs to see who can finally take out John Wick. <laughs> Literally had a radio announcer calling the fight and telling people where he's at of just this weird. You just have to like accept this insane world that they've created. And as soon as you do, 
It's a lot of fun to watch this live action cartoon. And you get it like this final little there's three s- sequences in a row here that it's just like, how did they do that? So the first one is this car chase in traffic leading to a fight in traffic and shootout in traffic where you're seeing this car weaving in and out and the the shots are all done in a way to where Keanu Reeves' face is lit up. Still has stylized lighting while racing through traffic. How do you do that? I'm not sure. How do you have John Wick, how do you have Keanu Reeves in the car doing this stuff, which Keanu Reeves shouldn't be doing because that is extraordinarily dangerous. So like, where does the VFX end and where does, like, how? where's the line? And it turns into this fight where you'll have a person get out of a car, gets kicked by John Wick into the car, or throws John Wick into the car, and then they spin, dodge a car that flies by them. You see their clothes, like, whoosh in the air, and then another car drives by that hits one of them. And why do I say all these details? Because it's all one shot. So you have a person actually interact with an item. It, they're, they're, you see them do a thing. And then you see them interact with a second thing. They interact with each other. And then one of them gets taken out. And then the things that are flying by them keep whooshing up their clothes. You can't actually have Keanu Reeves do a fight scene with cars flying by and then hit Keanu Reeves with a car. Because you will kill Keanu Reeves. So you don't know, like, I don't know what I'm seeing. I, like... Which cars are CGI and how did they make their shirts go whoosh in that moment? Or is that just like they had a fan off to the side that was 20 feet? Like, I don't know what they did. All I know is it was seamless, incorporating real practical things, stunt work and every like you can't just do that in post and like, let's figure it out later on. All of that has to be intricately staged to be able to have that many different elements work together and look so good and not give away the trick. That's what I say movie magic, where you really are in awe of like, what am I seeing right now? That's it. And they're not using cut. They're not using obvious cuts to cover up for it. And they're doing everything in their power there's one of the things that you do to hide when there's a VFX is you find a way to have your character interact with the environment so that that grounds it. I know you're not on a green screen because you just stepped off that step and touched a thing. And then at the end, you touched a thing. So you have them in touching things to, to make it clear they are in a real space. They are in that place that we're watching. And this, but if you have a long take, you have to have them interact with a lot of things. And that's what this this movie does in traffic. Like you you can't do any of this. It's too dangerous. So how did they do it? I'm not really sure. This leads to the next sequence where one of the things I talked about in my spoiler free review is how they even use different filming techniques in each environment. Always wide shots, always long takes, different filming techniques. So when you're in traffic, you're doing kind of these like camera's fairly still kind of backing up as they're walking through cars moving by them, all ending with someone getting hit by a car, two people getting hit by a car. Then it moves into a building where it starts off John Wick fighting a guy on a staircase and you're kind of watching this close-up shot. He grabs the dragon fire, shoots a guy, guy catches on fire. And all in the same shot, we're walking, walking up the stairs and then it it zooms back up and it becomes kind of this top-down view that We've seen this view in video games and, you know, forever, but all in one smooth transition. It starts 20 seconds in the stairwell, zooms out, and then we have John Wick running around with this fire dragon breath shotgun shooting people where you watch a person turn a corner, touch an item, gets shot by John Wick, falls over backwards on fire. And it keeps on moving and we go into a kitchen. And so like a guy's over a gas stove. So John Wick shoots that. So the the guy's torched and you see him running around and touching things that catch on fire. And then it transitions. It shuts a minute long or however long it is. That once again, that's that movie magic and using different techniques. So you, it's not one trick that they keep doing over and over again. You're not quite sure what's going on here. Like what is real? What is not? 
All I know is you can't set a person on fire and leave them like that for a minute. The best, like, and especially the people we're seeing, they're not wearing the big fireproof suit as you normally see it. That's, you know, normal movies, you know, they shoot the guy, cuts to guys on fire, and you can tell they're wearing, you know, one of those thick fireproof suits. They go, ah, like this for 10 seconds, and then it cuts because you have to put the person out. This shot, <laughs> this sequence is as multiple minute long shots with people laying there on screen on fire. So you don't know what you're seeing or how they did it. And of course, all this ends with the next sequence after this. Well, all right, I got to pause right here. I, didn't, I haven't talked too much about this guy. We have our tracker character with the dog. Obviously, fa franchise famous for its dogs. So we bring in a new character that loves his dog that is tracking down John Wick and just waiting for the price to go up. I don't feel this character needed to be in the movie because he doesn't serve a specific purpose other than maybe driving up the the price. But that would have happened anyway. You don't need a character being like, you got to raise the price. You got to raise the bounty. You don't need that to happen. You can just, the longer they go along and John Wick's not dying, Pennywise keeps raising the, the price. So I, I didn't feel like that was, he doesn't need to be there. I like the character and having a guy that has a dog that is just like purely for the money He's kind of cool. Um, and he's he's actually helping John Wick because he wants to make like he's keeping John Wick alive to make more money. That's an interesting little dynamic. But in a movie that's almost three hours long, I don't know that we needed one more character just to have one more cool character. But the great thing that comes out of it, you have this guy the whole time is just totally emotionless about anything. He just wants to make as much money as possible by keeping John Wick alive until he can kill him in the third act of the film. And you have this moment where John Wick has finally defeated this guy. And it once they're actually in hand-to-hand -hand combat, clearly John Wick is better than this guy. He's better than everybody. That's what John Wick does. And you get to a moment where the douchebag henchman of the Marquis that's been the douchebag, unstoppable henchman the whole movie is fighting the guy's dog. And he's got his sights on the dog. He's about to kill the dog. John Wick's about to kill Tracker Man. He's got his gun pointed at him. He looks over and sees that guy's about to kill a dog. No. <laughs> John Wick, instead of killing the guy trying to kill him, shoots the guy that's trying to kill the dog. In particular in this franchise, that moment has extra like, oh, like, like if you're gonna like a franchise with no sentimentality at all, and you find a little moment to just pause and like, Oh, John Wick, he 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 is a dog person. He he literally is putting his life on the line to try and save the dog. And in doing this also gets this guy right here to kind of like, you know what? I don't think I want to be on the side of the people that, that I don't want to team up with the guy that tried to kill my dog. Now, at the same time, of course, you sent your dog after that guy so that you can make the money. So like you put your dog in danger, like you're part of the reason dog almost got shot there. But yeah, but just that little moment of another dog guy in the mix. I don't, I think including this character in the movie just padded out the runtime a little bit too much. But if he's going to be in the movie, what a fun, what a, like a great little idea of have an additional character in the mix that uh, has is a dog person like John Wick. I was actually waiting for there to be a plot twist with this character of uh, whether he's like, like a long lost child of Halle Berry's character. And like, I'm actually here to help you because obviously the last film established her as the person that fights with dogs. This guy's fighting with dogs. Could, and like, he's kind of mysterious. Like he's helping John Wick, but he's also like trying to stretch out the contract. So I, I was wondering if like, maybe there's gonna be like a third act twist or something like that. No, he was just a guy that has a dog. <laughs> also like Halle Berry's character. So another game of it uh, seemed like that's kind of some of that stuff that it felt like, why is he here? What? Was there, what, what are we doing here? Um, if he's just here to have one more cool character and have a cool dog moment. So then we get to this third major set piece in this gigantic long set piece, the stairs. That right before this, John Wick falls from like the third story of a building, falls on a car, car bends in and he gets up. Uh, this is a movie you just have to accept. He's in God mode. <laughs> he just keeps on going. He's beat up, but there's just no 
important consequences of all of this, leading to another interesting location for a action set piece where you're on stairs, which stairs are very dangerous for humans if you fall down them. So you keep having these long takes of John Wick beating guys up, throwing them downstairs. And of course, in this set piece, John Wick gets to the top of the stairs only to find a group of guys who then kick him down the stairs. And they do this shot that of Keanu stuntman rolling down these stairs. And you can see them and... You know, maybe they use CGI to remove the pads or whatever, but you just like it looks like a guy falling on hard concrete steps. Hundreds of steps down, just a brutal, brutal thing. And then he keeps getting knocked down. And once again, those things that the shots are long enough that you can't really hide whatever you're doing. You can't hide the trickery. If there's a pad there on each of these steps, you could, you'd could you see it or you'd see it bend in or you'd see like the way that it hits a body would be different. So is that what they did of like we had padded stairs and then we went in and digitally removed the, the, the bend so that you just see the harsh. I don't know what they did, but I do know if you throw a person down concrete steps, they break a lot of bones. But then you get to the bottom of it. And they, they find all these little nice moments. This is what elevated this fourth film is finding the, the the complicated nature of John Wick's relationship with some of these characters where the blind man who is going to, he's, oh, he's going to kill John Wick, but he wants to do it in the right context, not through the cheating, not all this crap. He, he wants to win and hopefully he can find a way to do it that um, makes a point out of all of it. So he helps... John Wick get up the stairs and is like guiding him up and you, you get the moment in it where, uh, you know, they're obviously fighting each other and, uh, you get the moment where John Wick's about to lose. And then the tracker guy with the dog shoots the guy that hit the dog. And so you get him taking out the main douchebag henchman. And it, and of course the dog, chews up the guy's balls in the process and it, it, it even like pauses literally like I couldn't believe it went this far to have the dog pee on the guy's head <laughs> like of, of franchises where you can like out of nowhere have really like crass pee on face moment I guess you can get away with that in the John Wick franchise since it's like it's all about avenging a dead dog like the franchise that uh, the whole thing starts with a dead dog, in which case it's all about avenging cruelty against the animals. So then having a dog humiliate the guy that assaulted a dog in this movie. I'll take it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, we like, get along with get those nice moments of payoff all leading to kind of our, our final little sequence, the duel. And you get here and you they've they've set up the fact that John Wick is ready to die before the action starts. They're talking about what do they want on their tombstones? John Wick says his goodbyes, tells his friends, this is what you can put on my tombstone. And you get to this final moment and we've done an, like, we've done enough to make it clear. You, you do not want Marquis to, to win because he just can't win. You can't give him more power in the victory, but you want the blind man to win. He's done things that have made you mad. So you don't want him scot-free victory. You don't want full redemption, but he's done enough to redeem himself and given him enough backstory. And his daughter's innocent in all of this, that you want something there. And so you're like, how are they going to have that clever finale? And so they set up the rules, 30 paces, 20 paces, 10 paces. So 30 paces, both of them are able to hit each other. 20 paces, they hit each other again. They're both wounded. And so we move into 10 paces where... Like they're both in bad shape. And you're like, what, what are we going to do at this moment? What's going to happen? And they're the blind man and John Wick even exchange words that they said earlier in it. And you can tell there's like something, they've got something in the, the works here of like some sort of thought at the end of the day, both of them think the marquee that this guy's the worst. So how do we find a scenario to where, we can have our victory. So anyway, you come up with a scenario where they do their final round and the blind man shoots John Wick. John Wick goes down. The Marquis wants to finish off John Wick. So he grabs the gun and says, you're freed. Your daughter is removed from all everything. I'm going to kill this guy. 
So puts the bullet in there to try and kill him. And we're waiting, like, you know, something's, there's going to be something in here. And Winston goes, ah, you arrogant asshole. Like John Wick didn't shoot. <laughs> John Wick pops up, blows the guy's head off. And yeah, this like, you're able to have the victory of you've defeated, won the duel without needing to kill the blind man, without threatening the blind man's daughter. She's saved. She's free. Winston gets his hotel back and John Wick has ultimately been victorious. But at the same time, after you've been hit with 50 cars, fallen out of a window, fallen down 200 stairs multiple times and been shot without your Kevlar suit in the chest multiple times, comes to a moment where um, John Wick succumbs to his wounds while at peace, thinking about his, his wife. So a movie in my theater, they um they they botched this press screening bad. It was like poorly organized. They didn't think through what they were doing. I think it was new people or whatever. And so, um, they, and they they took up our phones, which they almost never do at press screenings. Like it, it's been like five years since the last time I was at a press screening where they took up our phone. And so this movie's three hours long. Nobody was getting up during the film to go to the bathroom. As soon as they have the final thing where Pennywise is shot. I think 40 people stood up and walked out of the movie before John Wick dies, before it makes it clear, like the end of the, before it's clear what happened at the end of the film, the ultimate outcome, kind of an important detail at the end of this film. I think 40 people left the theater either to go to the bathroom or try and get their phone before the mad dash, which it was like, I stayed throughout you know, the final moments of the movie, 10 minutes of credits, walk out in the hallway and there's, it's just packed with people and they're doing lottery style, just reading off numbers to try and get out our phone bag. It took 20 minutes to get phones back. But you get to the end of the film and they actually killed off John Wick. Now, my buddy saw this movie back in December at a test screening and there were two different, they tested two different endings. The ending that he saw apparently was this one where John Wick dies, but they tested a different ending to see how, which the people respond better to. Clearly, I guess they thought like, like the idea of John actually dying and not doing a happy, happily ever after ending, but um, so they died. So what, what do I think about that? Well, I, I, I feel like this isn't a, like if you don't want to keep making these forever, if you want to do something definitive, I, I think you kind of have to, as they, the whole point of all of this is that you can't have peace. Your peace was your five years with your wife. That's what you got. That was, that was it. But you're a man of death. Death is the only place you can truly find peace. Um, that thematically fits that you have to kill him off. It feels a little bit cheap to kill him off at the same time, because you put him in God mode for the last two movies really all of these movies, but especially the last two movies. If you have Winston walk up, shoot John, he falls off a skyscraper. And then this movie, I mean, he's hit by like five, 10 cars, keeps on going without being, being unfazed, falls out of the building, rolls down the steps, keeps on going. He's, like, he's stumbling a little bit, but he's still going. And then you have him die from the, the shootout. It just feels like, that was when it was convenient to kill him. He has plot armor until you, you it's convenient. That's where I feel like they, I don't know what the answer is because so much of the fun of these movies is the absurdity of them, how over the top it is. And we're like having these moments where he falls out of a building, lands on a car and the whole audience goes, Oh, that's the fun of it. But also you need to have a satisfying conclusion. And I mean, I think you, like you, I think you have to, <laughs> you can't let him live. I gotta, um, unless you want to keep doing this. I just don't, I think you, you look at it and you go, all right, Keanu was able to pull this off all the way up until age 60, much like Tom Cruise and his crazy. Those are like the two guys in their late fifties. Now Tom Cruise 60 that are like, wow, that's you, you guys are impressive. You can't keep doing it. And I think they're just acknowledging that of like, all right. And I, at the same time, I think the, you know, it certainly stated that he's dead. If they want to find an excuse to bring him back, we didn't actually see that body put in a casket, put in the ground. We saw him fall over on steps and we saw them at the funeral. They, they stated he's dead, but 
They want to come up with an excuse like he, the only way to escape was to fake his death. You can do that. I'm not recommending they do that at the moment. But if they got a story, Keanu Reeves is still up for it. They haven't missed yet with this franchise. So maybe it would be awesome. So and then, and then we get a post credit scene at the end of it where um, teases just a little bit the daughter of our manager in Japan. She goes after the blind man and they don't they don't go anywhere. They don't actually they just tease that she's out to get him. They just follow it up like she's not done. She's not done with him. And uh, they probably did that the right way because you don't actually want to see that guy die and you don't want to see him kill her. But implying letting our minds be creative of ooh, where's that going? Ooh, what's going to come of that? Probably the right play for that little bit. Anyway, um, final thoughts on the John Wick franchise as a whole. I'll have my ranking on it tomorrow, but final thoughts is just kind of overall talk. I feel like the John Wick franchise is better as a whole than in than its parts. Every part to me is like a B plus, A minus, incredible action, awesome world building, cool characters. But there's always something about the story, storytelling, pacing that is is a little bit not quite there. So it's like awesome that we have all these things. There's no major missteps in my mind, but all of them are just flawed enough in their the way that they're structured that none of them are like a masterpiece. But all of them as a whole is easily the premium, top notch Hollywood action franchise of the last 10 years. And I don't, I don't even think there's like close competition. Like it's, they're just, they're just way up here of like incredible action and a fun world that you want to spend time in with characters that are interesting. But each story, each story has something that about it that's a little bit off. And same with this one. I think, I don't think it needed to be this long and, you know, John Wick being indestructible until he's suddenly not stuff like that, where it's like, I, if you could have incorporated like he's slowly breaking down throughout the film and there's like there's things they could have done to like like pause to show his deterioration to where you buy into the last little bit a little bit more and doesn't feel like he's indestructible until the it's convenient for not so anyway just fantastic action awesome world building almost a masterpiece like all the other ones, almost a masterpiece, but not quite for me. Let me know you guys' thoughts down below in the comment section. As you know, I had to shoot this video pretty quickly because I'm shooting everything in advance because I'm leaving town heading to, to Cleveland. Hopefully some of you guys watching this will actually meet me in person tomorrow at, with Austin Burke and John Flickinger um, at Fan Expo Cleveland. I'd love to meet you there. If you want more action content, check out these videos right over here. Thank you so much for watching. Keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.